Okay, welcome everyone again. So today we will continue our discussion on reinforcement learning for demand response. Uh, so first I'm going to do a recap on the, what, uh, everything we discussed yesterday regarding demand response and why we can use uh, reinforcement learning to solve problems in demand response and also the standardization used in open AIM environments. And then I will discuss more about the actual implementation using PyTorch, uh, CityLearn, and also the OpenAI stable baselines. And then we will do some practice on, on running some simple algorithms and trying some different uh, hyperparameters. Yeah, so first of all, we discuss that as a motivation for demand response in general, we have to say that electricity uh, has a high value compared to its price. So in general, it's not worth uh, taking so many decisions for the consumers or trying to cause any kind of discomfort in the users in order to save uh, some dollars in their energy bills. And therefore, the successful uh, demand response programs must always provide uh, good energy savings, uh, good cost savings, <clears throat> but always in an autonomous way and without uh, reducing the dis dissatisfaction of the, of the consumers, whether it's at, at the residential level or at the commercial level. And then we discussed that there, there were different types of, of loads. So some of them are uh, much more flexible than others. And we can actually modify or curtail them without really causing much of, of discomfort to the, uh, to the users. In this case, uh, we are talking more about domestic hot water heaters, electric vehicles, batteries, uh, chiller plants in commercial buildings that we can use to store ice, for example, for cooling and then also the thermal mass of the building, while some other loads were actually much harder to, uh, to modify, although this might change in the future. But in reinforcement learning uh, and demand response, we will be focusing more on the most uh, flexible loads. So reinforcement learning is a plug and play controller, and then we can make use of the increasing availability of data to train it. And then there are more and more algorithms coming out that are uh, increasingly stable. So regard, uh, in comparison to the rule-based controller or to the MPC, we can, uh, we can implement it in a more inexpensive way and also achieve good performance uh, thanks to the use of data. Regarding research in general, uh, there has been an explosion in research in this field, especially in electric vehicles and uh, heating, cooling, and, and ventilation uh, systems, using reinforcement learning in order to coordinate them with each other. Then we saw the differences between uh, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. In supervised learning, we had the inputs and some outputs or labels, and we will compare them with each other, find some error, and update the model in order to minimize the error between our predictions and the, and the actual labels. In a supervised learning, we all only had the input, and we needed to extract some kind of features. And then in reinforcement learning, it's more of a control problem. We are trying to find the optimal actions given some certain states. And this set of actions are called the policy. It's a function that maps some states with some optimal actions. And we are trying to learn that policy uh, that will be optimal if we are able to, opti uh, to maximize the number of rewards that we obtain in the long term. So this is very important. In reinforcement learning, we have the environment. And the environment has always, always needs to follow a Markov decision process, or MDP, uh, which means that the transition probability for, to transition from one state to another when you take an action must always depend on the current state and the action that you are taking, and not the previous states or actions. And then for a given state taking an action, we obtain a reward, and there's a probability of transition into a different state. So then reinforcement learning is trying to learn uh, is trying to learn a policy that is going to go through this Markov decision process, maximizing the number of rewards that it's obtaining. Then we discuss about the value function, uh, that there is a value of a given state, which means that is, and, and for a given policy, which means that if we are in a given state and we start to follow a specific policy, this is all the accumulated sum of the rewards that we are going to obtain from that state and following that policy that we have learned. And then we discuss the discount factor. So the greater our discount factor is, 
and we typically want it to be high, uh, we will be looking more ahead in the future and trying to optimize more long-term rewards. While if it's closer to zero, we're just trying to focus on maximizing the immediate next uh, rewards. So we have the environment and, and the agent. The environment is everything that has to do with our reward. So it might be the building, uh, the energy systems within the building, and also the weather conditions or any, anything that if, you, if the agent takes an action to this environment, will output the state and the reward. And then the agent is just the controller that will take these actions by looking at the states and trying to optimize the rewards. And the objective is to find the optimal policy. Then we discussed that there were some different types of reinforcement learning algorithm. Uh, we had some model-based and then the model-free ones that are typically more interesting for us. And we have off-policy and on-policy methods. So the off-policy methods, we said that they, ca they can make use uh, from historical data in order to be trained. And the on-policy ones uh, can only be trained online which means that we need to take the actions in order to train them. And we cannot really look at the historical data in order to make all the, update, all the updates. And then in reinforcement learning, the agent has no knowledge of the rewards or of the reward function or the transition probabilities. And it's just learning them through interaction with this environment. Then we discuss the most basic type of reinforcement learning, the Q-learning which in the tabular approach has uh, many different states and many different actions. And we are just trying to find all the Q values for every state and every possible action. We have the Q value function that we can, uh, we can find out iteratively by visiting all the states and actions infinitely as many times. Uh, we saw that this is not really a trackable problem because then the number of Q values that you need to, to update uh, increases exponentially with your number of states and actions. So in order to generalize better and, and generalize between states and actions we have never observed, then what we use is that we replace this Q table by uh, an artificial neural network in which we input uh, all these states and actions. We just use them as inputs and then we're trying to, to map the different Q values. So the reinforcement learning agent will take some, will visit some state and take some actions. We'll store all this information in, in batches. And then it will start making these updates using this equation. And then finding the Q values and then the neural network is being trained to map these Q values. And the neural network itself is used to find the maximum Q value in a given state and to, to update this equation. The problem with this approach was that uh, it's good for continuous states, but not for continuous uh, actions. Uh, this can only use discrete actions. And the problem was that uh, for a given state in which we are, uh, the system is located, it will need to try all possible combinations of actions to find all the Q values for that state and then find the maximum one. So again, this is a problem that uh, has more trackability in terms of the, act of the states but it is still untrackable if we have uh, many different possible actions because we need to try them all in order to update, update this equation. So then what we did is to use an actor critic method. The, this uh, network here is a critic network, so we added a second network that is the actor network that will just find the optimal action for a given state. So then we, we no longer need to try all the possible actions in, in this neural network to find the optimal key value, but we only input the state into the actor network. We obtain the optimal action, then we input this action into the, the critic network and update this equation. And this makes the problem trackable for both uh, states and, and actions. And then we discuss also about some state-of-the-art reinforcement learning algorithms uh, we had the, the of policy methods, which are, for example, the yeah, TD3 or DDPG and the soft actor critic, which is probably the most stable right now. And then on policy methods, uh, for example, the proximal policy optimization is good, but since it's on policy, it cannot really learn from historical data. So for a simulation, uh, it will work well, but if we are going to implement it into an actual system, it might take too long. 
it to run because it's not very sample efficient. And then we discussed also about the OpenAI gym environments and how important it is to standardize research in this field. If we all use reinforcement learning to tackle the same kind of problems, then we can easily compare them with each other and see which ones are uh, working better. We also saw that there are some uncertainty bands when we run reinforcement learning. If we run it twice, it might obtain different results because of the initialization of the parameters. And, and then the OpenAI gym environments are made to compare different algorithms. So we developed our own using, uh, yeah, called CityLearn, uh, in order to provide demand response <coughs> using reinforcement learning. So in the CityLearn environment, uh, we have the electrical grid that we, we will be using later. And then we have the different heat pumps that provide a heating, a cooling energy to different buildings, and then the electric heaters that will provide the heating. Then we have some solar panels, and then they all consume electricity from the same feeder. So the, obje the objective is to do load uh, shaping in that same feeder by minimizing the peaks of electricity consumption, maximizing the load factor, and optimizing some other metrics. So the objective here is to uh, create a controller that can be implemented in as many buildings as we want, and that will learn from the environment, from the building itself and the surrounding buildings, and, and we learn how to take the optimal actions uh, to store and release energy into the building and try to optimize energy consumption at the, at the feeder level. And we can do this in a either centralized approach in which the agent will be a central agent that can take as many actions as, as buildings we have, or it can be the centralized agents, one control per every building, and then that can take uh, its own actions. And then the difficulty with having the decentralized agent is that the environment will be dynamic. Uh, we will be rewarding uh, every building based on probably the energy consumption at the feeder level, which doesn't, if we use a decentralized controller, it doesn't depend only on the actions on, of this specific building itself, but it will also depend on what the other buildings are doing. So if we try decentralized controllers, then we need to somehow share some information or coordinate the buildings in order to, to get, their, get them coordinate and, and make the whole environment follow a Markov decision process. For the purpose of this course, we will just use a central, a central agent. And since it might take a long time to run, we will only run it on for one specific building and try to minimize the peaks in one specific building instead of the whole neighborhood. So now I will discuss a bit about uh, different deep, uh, uh, deep learning packages that we can use. So the most popular ones right now are TensorFlow that we saw the, the other day and then Keras and PyTorch. So TensorFlow is uh, very popular for taking models into production at the industrial level and, and also in the, in the academic world is also very used. Uh, the problem is that it's a bit more difficult to learn and, and to use than the other two packages. If you implement it, then it runs really fast, especially if you have a lot of data. Then Keras is probably the, it's a higher level APA and it's probably the simpler to learn how to use. But then if you are going to implement things at a very low level and you want to, to change like very specific things, it might be, it might be a bit hard to do uh, research wise. And then PyTorch is more flexible, it's fast, although not as, fa not as fast as TensorFlow for some applications. But then you can develop algorithms really easily, almost as in Keras. And then it's also very popular in the research community and it's increasing the popularity. So the main advantage of... Just a simple mm -hmm. question. So for TensorFlow, you said um, it has been used for um, in, um, taking models into production for real world application. Any application that we have heard of? I mean, I'm reading about this, all these packages and I've seen uh, that at the, at the industry level. So, so TensorFlow is made by uh, Google. Oh, okay. And then PyTorch by Facebook. Uh, so yeah, what I what I read typically is that TensorFlow will run much faster. For example, if you want to implement some machine learning application mm -hmm. for Android for your phone, then TensorFlow, I think the backend is in C++. So then it will it will run much faster. Mm -hmm. While if you do it with PyTorch, it will take a bit longer. 
So, yeah. But yeah, I don't know what, like yeah. very specific like, examples. Okay, yeah. So the, the main advantages of all these packages, not only PyTorch, uh, although we will be using, I will be showing how to use PyTorch, uh, is that it has automatic differentiation capabilities, uh, which means that it will save all the variables that we have as tensors or multi-dimensional arrays, and then it will save the derivatives of every operation inside these tensors. So then when we want to do like back propagation or some kind of derivative, then all these derivatives are already stored and then they are really easy to, to perform if we want to run any kind of optimization algorithm. And then they are mostly used to implement neural networks and also for reinforcement learning. If we want to do other kinds of machine learning, such as uh, know, clustering or other types of regression, maybe using random forest or some other uh, algorithms, then we, we might want to use other packages, such as uh, SciPy or yeah, some others. So in PyTorch, this is, the, so this is the critic network. So if we want to implement it in PyTorch, for example, then this is how, how we would do it. Uh, we define the class uh, critic network, and then we initialize it with the different, with the different inputs which will be the states and then the, the number of actions. And then we will define also the sizes, the sizes of the hidden layer. And then we define a forward uh, method that will take the action and the, and the state and will return the key value, which in this case is the variable x. Then we will have multiple uh, linear layers that are just uh, multiplications, matrix multipli multiplications of the weights with all these parameters. So here we have all our different weights in the different layers. Uh, so this linear function is just multiplying uh, the inputs by the size of the hidden layer, which is all these weights. And then the second layer is multiplying the output of this other layer by the weights of the of the second hidden layer and so on and so forth. And then the final layer has only one weight, which is here. So if yeah. you have two hidden layers, then you have to add another yeah. line, of course. So if, if you want to keep increasing here the number of layers, uh, you will just need to continue adding more linear, mm. uh, more linear layers, yeah. And then we also, here we have all the activation functions. All these layers are linear, so if we didn't have activation functions, functions we would just be doing linear regression with a lot of variables. So we need to add some kind of linearity so the neural network can learn. And as we discussed the other day, one of the most popular activation functions, because it's really fast, is the ReLU function, which is just zero for negative inputs and then it increases linearly with positive inputs. So, so yeah, typically this, then this layer is really fast and is good enough for most applications. We just want to adjust the number of hidden layers, which typically with one hidden layer or, or two maximum will be fine. And then we also want to define the number of neurons in each of the hidden layers. So yeah, typically like a, ram, a rule of uh, thumb will be that the first hidden layers will be higher, inter, uh, will have more neurons, and then as we approach the output, we will have l less number of neurons. But this yeah, doesn't necessarily always have to be like that. So yeah, here we define all the ReLU functions that will take the outputs of the multiplication of the weights by the inputs of every layer, and then it will output the, the results. Yeah, th this last layer is also really important because it defines, uh, the, it defines the, how the output is going to look like. So the key values can go from minus infinity to, up to plus infinity. So then the output activation function is linear and it goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. If we are trying to predict something that goes from like zero to one, like a probability, then here we will use an activation function that is the sigmoid activation function that only goes from zero to one. So we need to look at the range of our output that we are trying to predict and define the output activation function according to that to follow the same range of operation. So for example, if, I, 
if we have an actor network and our uh, action will only go from zero to one, we use the sigmoid function. If it goes from minus one to one, then we will use a tanh uh, function that goes from minus one to one. If the action can be any value in the real uh, numbers, the, in the real domain, then it will, be, it will be a linear activation function, the output. Yeah, so let's see how we would do all of this in, in PyTorch. Uh, so as we mentioned earlier in the critic function, we are, uh, pre we are making a prediction on the Q value, and then we are comparing it with a target Q value that we have found iteratively with the equation. And we will compare both of them, we will find the error, and we will try to update the network according to this error. So this is the function that we are using for the updates. So in order to define the, the loss, we will first define the criterion that we will use, in this, ca in this case the mean square error loss. So we will use this error function to, to update our network. And then the, the criterion that we use, the mean square error, is taking both the prediction and the target. And then it's comparing both of them, uh, finding their mean square error, and then it will back propagate it. Yeah, the prediction and the target are multidimensional. It's not a single number, but it's a batch of observations. So here we will find this Q loss for our batch size. If our batch size is one, then this will be a single number, single number, we'll compare both of them and find the loss. If our batch size is of 100, it will find the mean square error of the, of the 100 observations. Make the mean of all of them, and then make the update with that batch size. So the higher the batch size, the lower the variance between the different updates will be. Because we have a very high batch size, so let's say, let's say it's like a million then it doesn't matter if we sample randomly like a million, million observations differently, like they will all be more or less the same, equally distributed. So when we do the updates using a very large batch size, all the errors will look more or less the same. If we use a batch size that is really small, then there will be a higher variability with, with, with different uh, updates that we will make. So then it will be harder to get stuck in a, in a local minimum when we are trying to update the neural network, but also we will be adding more noise to, our, uh, to the updates because of this variability, if this makes sense. And then we will also make the update on, the, yeah, on this equation, uh, which is yeah, pretty straightforward, just finding the target and updating with the reward function, and then the Q, value, the Q value is discounted by the discount factor, which might be 0 0.99. And then we have the, the target values. So the target <laughs> values are found, as I, as I mentioned earlier, by taking, the, yeah, by, the, by taking the output of the actor layer, and then input the output of the actor layer into the critic network for a given state and finding the Q value. So in the, in the case of uh, some uh, reinforcement learning applications to increase more stability, we will not only have one critic network, but we might have two critic networks, which is the ones you can see here. Here is one critic network and the, the second one. And then what we do is, uh, so in reinforcement learning, when, when we make the updates using these networks, the, all the updates that, that we make will have a positive, uh, will have a positive bias which means that in general we will be overestimating the Q values. And this is because we are only taking the maximum here. By taking the Q value that maximizes the action, we are making a positive bias and overestimating the Q values. Because our, maybe our, um, our neural network might have some noise or error, and then when we find the maximum value, we are also finding the maximum of that error, and we are overestimating the Q values. So in that case, we, uh, what we can do is to use two critic networks, and then we find the outputs of the, of the Q values of these two critic networks, and we take the minimum of the two. That way, that way we try to reduce the, to mitigate the problem of the overestimation of the Q values by using two critic networks, finding their Q values, and finding the minimum between the two. And it's the one that we use for the updates. Uh, yeah, here this is for the yeah, soft actor critic method. You can just ignore this part for now. And then, yeah, so we find the target Q values, which are here. This policy network is the actor network. 
we find the next actions that we input uh, here to find the target key values. So this action is found in the policy network, the actor network, and then this, this would be the critic and find this. So yeah, so coming to the, uh, to the neural network before. So now let's see how we should update all these parameters. Because we have two or possibly three neural networks if we have two critics and one actor network. And we need to start to use PyTorch or any package that we are using in order to update all the different weights of these neural networks. In order to try to fit the Q value function and also to find a mapping between the states and the optimal actions. So let's go by step by step. Uh, we just input uh, the, the next state we are in or this state, we input it here, we obtain the optimal action, and then from this, we just go to the critic network with this action that we found in the actor network, and then we find the optimal Q value, we take it to this equation, and then we need to do back propagation uh, here. We find the target, we compare it to the prediction of uh, the critic network, using this state and this action. And then we find the error using the mean square error of these two values. And then we do back propagation here. So we try to minimize uh, this, this loss function by taking the gradient of this loss function as a function of the weights or the parameters of the neural network. And then here we need to do back propagation again because the from the yeah from the actor network, we we use the actor network to find uh, these values. So uh, we need to use the critic network to update the parameters of the actor network. So what we want to do is to do to find the gradient of the Q values uh, as a function of the actions. So we want to find the path in the Q value function that will lead us to take the right actions to maximize this gradient. So then when we want to do back propagation in order to update uh, all our neural networks, what we do is that we use the, the chain rule of derivation. We need, to, we need to take the derivatives of all of the error as a function of all the parameters or weights that we have in our neural networks. So we need to start going layer by layer by taking all the derivatives of this error and then using the chain rule of derivation in order to, uh, to find all the gradients of all the parameters and make all the updates layer by layer. Um, just and a simple question. So every network will be separately uh, trained, right? Well, I mean, they are all interlinked with each other. So we train, we need to do back propagation, the critic network, and then depending on the critic network, we have the actor network, and then we need to to, to find the gradient of the Q values as a function of the actions, mm. and then yeah, apply all of this, yeah, yeah. So when you, for instance, you, you train the actor network, uh, you just have the ST values and then you A star T's, and you try to uh, train the network itself, right? Yeah. But you don't go back to your uh, critic network or the output policy or anything. Uh, so when you are training the actor network, it's a sim you know individually will be trained, right? Not at the same time with your critic network, or if you have multiple critic network. No, yeah, yeah. So it goes yeah step by step. Yeah, okay. But but yeah, what I want to show is that this is like actually really complex because we have all these parameters, we have all these like actions that uh, all these variables that in theory we will need to take all the derivatives from. Uh, so yeah, basically it's like a mess. <laughs> and yeah, and then this is why we just use uh, the auto differentiation tool that I was discussing in PyTorch, which will store all these derivatives of, of all the parameters, and then it will very easily find all the make all these updates. It's, you know, instead of making all the derivatives and using the the chain rule to update all the weights that that's how analytically we would need to do it. Yeah, we, we just write our code, like, forward, like how we make all these updates that I was saying, 
saying earlier, like for the uh, Q value function and all of that. So we write our code just forward with all the error and everything. And then when we want to make the updates, we just find the loss function and write uh, the method backward. Which, and then and we just uh, make the optimizer and take a step, step on the optimizer. So the backward will just uh, backpropagate all the errors into our uh, equations and all the operations that, that we have been doing in our code. All the derivatives are already stored there. And then we just, we defined previously the critic, the optimizer for the critic and for the actor. So we will just take the step. And everything that is linked will be optimized, all, all our parameters. So that makes it like much uh, simpler. Yeah. And then if we are going, and this is if we are going to code our own reinforcement learning algorithm using PyTorch from scratch. But then if we just want to use one of the stable baselines, then it's much easier, not only to make the updates, but just to test our environment. That we just need to import this, decide what kind of policy we want to, to do, and then define our model, feed it with the environment that we have. In this case, it could be city learn, but it can be the inverted pendulum that I showed the other day or any other. And then we just write like model, model learn, the number of time steps that we want to do, to run for, and then it will automatically use, apply reinforcement learning for that, uh, for that environment. So yeah, that makes it a lot easier. So yeah, so later I can show some more code in PyTorch, but for the, yeah, for the coding part, I think we will just use the OpenAI stable baselines which will be much faster and then we can, we can tune some of the hyperparameters. So I'm going to discuss some of the basic functions of OpenAI gym environments. Yeah, the main ones uh, are, we have the environment that we have defined. So we will have the observation space, which is our state space with all the states that we have. And we can just type low or high in order to find the upper boundaries and the lower boundaries of every single state that we have. And this is useful for normalization purposes. Yeah, as Spiros uh, discussed the other day, showing, uh, uh, teaching about neural networks, it's very important to normalize the inputs of our, our neural networks between zero and one, or to normalize them uh, somehow. That is because if we have a state that goes from, you know, from zero to a million, and another that, wants from, that goes from zero to one, if we initialize our neural network with random weights, if some of these states have extremely high values and some have extremely low values, then all the weights will be initialized randomly anyway. So then our output uh, will contain a much higher contribution from the features that have a very high range and a very small contribution of the features that go only from, from zero to one, for example. And then when we find the error and we backpropagate it, the features that were really large in, in the, the dimensions were really large will have a much higher impact in how we are updating the network than the states that had a very high uh, lower value. So what we do is that we just normalize all the states, either uh, subtracting the, the mean and dividing by standard deviation or more typically just setting the boundaries and scaling from zero to one. Yeah, so this is what we mostly use this for in order to scale these features, yeah. So those are um, variables in the open uh, environment. And if you set them, does that mean the scaling already happens automatically? Or do you need to set the boundaries and then do some additional work to make sure the scaling happens? In the environment in CityLearn that I provided? Or, or more generally? More generally. So typically in the open AIGM environments, they are already set. And in the environment that I provided, uh, CityLearn is already reading all the states that you select. It's finding the maximum and minimum value, and it's already doing all of that. So typically, you, you don't need to, I mean, it depends on your problem. For OpenAI environments, you don't need to set, you don't need to define them. They're already defined. But if I write my own environment, and I set these parameters, like, say, between 0 and 100, mm -hmm. Does that then automatically do the scaling, or do I need to do additional work to do the scaling? No, so when you write your agent, you need to use these features to, to do the scaling. 
Okay. So you do the scaling yeah. in the agent? In, in the agent, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the agent is the one that contains the neural network. So the environment contains these values. And then when you provide the environment to the, your agent, you will read these values and you will use it to do the scaling in your agent. Awesome. Thank you. Makes sense. Yeah. Sorry, just a further clarification. So this, mm -hmm. this is an output to give you the information in order to scale your mm -hmm. yeah. features. Okay. And then it's up to you whether you scale it as a um, zero to one mm -hmm. from the min and the max or whether you standardize it using the standard yeah. deviation mean. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's up to you. But yeah. I mean, this doesn't provide yeah, the standard deviation of or any of that, but, but you, can, you can provide it too. And then, yeah, and then this is for the action space. So we will, only f we will also find uh, the, the boundaries, the upper and lower boundaries of the actions that we can take. This is also important to know, in the especially in the exploration phase, we want to know uh, what kind of actions we are going to take. Yeah, if they will be from 0 to 1, minus 1 to 1, or if they can be any value. So this is something that we need to know. And we also need, it, need to know it because when we define the actor network, we need to define the output activation function. So depending on what these boundaries are, we might want to use one activation function or another. And then we have the, the reset function of our environment. This will simply take the environment back to the initial state and it will return that initial state. So whenever we want to run our environment, we will always do reset first, obtain the very first observation and then use that observation to take the first action. And then we take that action using a step. So we just input that action into the environment and this will return, among other things, uh, the next states, the reward that you are obtaining. And then you will store this new state, reward, and the previous state into your batch to start making all the updates on the queue, on the queue function. And then if we want to take a random action in our environment, we can go to the environment.action space and just, and just type a sample. And this will automatically select a, select a random action uh, within these boundaries. So yeah, so if we, let's say we are doing exploration and then we want to take a random action 50% of the time. Yeah, we just type a random number, and if it falls from you know, 0 to 0 0.5, we take a random action, and we just do action space sample, and it will automatically take that random action. Yeah, so now uh, with the environment, we will do some, some tuning of the algorithms. So there should be a spreadsheet in this link, and then using your birthday, you can select a different learning rate, a batch size, and, and tau function. Uh, for the OpenAI stable baselines. So yeah, so depending on yeah on your birthday, yeah, then you can select uh, different hyperparameters that will fall within these ranges or this type of uh, batch sizes, or the tau function. Uh, yeah, the tau the tau hyperparameter I didn't dis I didn't discuss it uh, earlier, but it's it's just a it's just a factor that is telling us how fast we are updating our networks. Uh, also similarly to the learning rate with some minor differences. So if you go to the, yeah, to this example of the central agent, you can see the soft actor critic, and then we will have the learning rate, we will keep the gamma to 0 0.99, and then we have the tau and the batch size. Uh, yeah, and then we will define the total number of steps to 15, multiplied by the number, the number of hours of one year. So then we can all run it and then we can, we can go to the spreadsheet that should be here. And then you can run the three hyperparameters that you chose. And then the, you will obtain all these rewards. So we'll, you will just take the maximum of them and also write it on the spreadsheet. Yeah, and then once we have all of these, I will just plot the reward obtained as a function of the learning rate, the batch size, and the tau function to see what we get. Yeah, I think, and I think this should take maybe 10 to 15 minutes to run or something like that.